Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship service. Uh, for those of you who are new today, I, I see at least one new face. We do welcome you. Uh, we don't want to burden you and recognize you personally, but please um, stay a little bit after worship so that we could greet you. Uh, for those of you who are returning, uh, thank you for joining us here today. Let me um, invite you to follow through with me a few announcements. Uh, today we have uh, three important announcements that needs our attention. First, uh, like Grace prayed, we are at the heels of our retreat. Next weekend is our retreat. We're excited. Praise God. You know, we, we set out early this year with um, planning this retreat for perhaps maybe like 20 people. We said, you know, if 20 people could go, you know, it would be, be a blessing. And then over time, as more momentum picked up, people were excited. God was blessing us. And etc. And you know we have close to like 50 people attending this retreat. Amen. Yeah, including you know not, it's just numbers. Not numbers. Numbers don't mean a whole lot. But um, you know 50 people with within us is, is almost everyone. And so <laughs> so praise God. You know that uh, you are in support of the retreat. And if you didn't register but you still want to attend, there's still um, opportunity. So please talk with Patrick at the end of service. If you want to come by, uh, we would love to accommodate you. Okay. Uh, but with that retreat announcement, we're leaving this Friday afternoon. Our first session is 8 p.m. For those of you who are arriving a little bit later, uh, we have a, a dinner, sandwich dinner prepared. So just come and eat. You don't have to like, uh, you know, worry about food. Uh, we'll start the program at 8 p.m. and then the program will end 11 a.m. on Sunday and we will all return back to church in time for our 2 p.m. regular Sunday worship. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Uh, as a result of that, we're not going to be having our regular early morning prayer that Saturday. All right, Passion Week, one week leading up to Easter, there will be an early morning prayer for us uh, six days during the week, Monday through Saturday in the morning, 525. Uh, and then Good Friday service, we would have it here, 7.30 p.m. Friday night, okay? So please keep that mindful. And of course, Easter Sunday, you know, we are actively engaged in this campaign of inviting the unchurched, inviting those who have fallen away to come and share their worship experience with us. And, you know, we have a little card uh, that's actually in the, in the table outside. An invitation card, just for you to kind of hand it out. I keep forgetting to bring it up here with me. And I'm, I'm sorry, but it's just there. You know, it's, it's pretty easy. Yeah, if somebody could just bring it. Um, that, you know, is for you to take, very casual, and just, you know, share with somebody, pass it out, etc. Thank you, Bianca. And maybe she will bring it up here. All right, it, it looks like this, Easter. And then it just has our ministry name and an address below. Okay, so... You know, if you want to just casually just dish this out to people, that would be fantastic, okay? Third announcement, baptism. Uh, thankfully, with one of our members' generosity, they've opened up their home to allow us to participate in baptism by immersion. And, you know, there's three forms of baptism. There's sprinkling of the water, which is fine. You know, infants generally do that. There's a pouring of the sacred water over the person, you know, pouring baptism. And then there's the real baptism, which is dunking, okay? That's what we want to do. I'm just kidding. All three are genuinely good, okay? But the most effect is the dunking, immersion. And, of course, with that, we need a pool or some body of water. And Jilan and her husband, John, they have a backyard with a heated pool and a jacuzzi. Fantastic. <laughs> Because it's important in April, it's still going to be a little bit cold. We're going to have baptism April 8th on a Saturday, Saturday at 2 p.m. And so we have at least four people who are going to be immersed, okay? But we want to make this a celebratory event. So if you could make that time, come and join us together and celebrate together baptism for them as well as for us. Baptism is a sign and seal of our faith. It does not save us salvation, but it brings us into a, a community of believer that's saying, yes, I belong to this community called Christian body. Okay, that's what baptism does. 
But with the congregation, with us, coming together to view that, you know, I think it's going to be beautiful. Okay? And so uh, we'll announce it you know, a couple more times before the, the coming day. For those of you who are interested, uh, want to be baptized, please see me as soon as possible. April 1st, the week prior to that, we're going to have a baptism class to go over the essentials of that time. Okay? If you have been infant baptized, but have not received baptism as an adult, it's typically called a confirmation, uh, excuse me, yeah, confirmation. However, I, I'm open to the tradition of baptizing you by immersion as well, okay? And so if you want that experience, great. You know, we welcome you to that as well. All right, so hopefully those three things, you know, is, is quite a bit in there. You could always refer to the bulletin or our website for detailed information as well. That said, I want to invite you to rise so that we can recite the Apostles' Creed together, followed by our passage for today. So please join me in reading this out loud, out loud the Apostles' Creed. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you're standing, let us read together, alternately, our passage today, coming from the Gospel of Matthew, first 12 verses of chapter 23. Matthew 23, let me begin with verse 1, invite you to read alternately. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, some of you may have heard my conversion experience as well as my early years as a Christian. Uh, bear with me. I want to share that again for the sake of today's message. So 1985, second year in college at USC in Southern California, I was a... Um, Church core, but basically attending church. Second year in college, I received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. April Fool's Day it was a spring retreat. Fooled, fooled greatly, right? Almost immediately, I was just like so excited for the gospel, so excited to love God, and you know, I was engaged in reading the Word, attending services, attending different events, etc., and just like. School was not that interesting anymore, you know? Um, so all, all along, right? Just full force, doing all kinds of stuff, prayer life, etc. And uh, about six months into it, there was a, 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 an event at ch uh, a school, an uh, on-site um, campus ministry event, where the speaker came and, you know, shared a word of God, etc. So I attended that event, and... In that event, the speaker um, spoke, you know, various encouraging words, but he also had a gift of prophecy. 
prophetic encouragement. And as an example, so after the end of the message, you know, he would call out some people, you know, like, Nare, you know, I, I see the way you, you know, play and dance before me with music, and I love the way you sing. And, you know, it's like words of confirmation, words of affirmation. You know, Rob, you know, I, I, I hear your prayer. I, I see the way you move in that you know, ring, et cetera, right? And all these different things, right? As if the speaker knew them, but, you know, he really didn't know them personally, but with the sensing of the Holy Spirit, you know, like encourage people. Maybe some person was like, you know, maybe ill and sick, you know, and, and there'd be words of comfort, etc. So I'm sitting there, I'm like sitting there towards the back, and I'm like anticipating for my name to be called. And what I'm anticipating is words of, not just encouragement, but words of praise. You know, because after all, man, I've been, search, I've been seeking Jesus like no other, you know? And I was like expecting me to be called like, Matthew, I love the way that you love me, you know? <laughs> I, I see your passion in, in, your, in your heart and mind, and I, and I just like, you know, you're, you're the best, you know, newly minted Christian ever. You know, that's, those are kind of the words that I was expecting, right? Well... All that was said, and the meeting was over. I didn't get called. So at the end, I, I go up to the man. I say, is there a word of God for me? And he looked at me and said, in the kingdom of God, there is no competition. <laughs> I was stunned. I was just like <laughs> devastated. Right? You know what, what, what it means, right? I was seeking God, but all for the wrong reasons. I was loving on God, chasing after God in a competitive way. In my heart, my motive was not right. I was trying to be better than the other guy who was, who's been a Christian five years prior. I was trying to learn more or, or you know, thought that I was, I was uh, a, more spiritual than somebody who had been born into the church. And that was kind of the motive that I was pursuing God. And he pointed that out and said, in the kingdom of God, there is no competition. My pursuit of Christ was in a competitive way. And I crumbled. And I like, you know, after everybody had left, I just like sat in one chair. I just crumbled and with tears coming down, tears of regret, tears of remorse, tears of shame. You know, and I said, oh God, you know, why, why, is, why is this? Why is this happening to me? This is so embarrassing. But thank God I didn't get called out in front of everyone. <laughs> I think that was the grace of God, right? So after that event, I, I started you know, kind of analyzing my heart. You know, what? why am I so competitive? Why, does, why do I have this competitive heart? And to not blame on any particular thing, this is, this is what came to my mind. That's kind of the way I was raised. That was the environment that I was, you know, part of. It was a culture that I was immersed in. Very competitive. Wouldn't you agree? For those of you, you know, who now are in your 40s and 50s, even when we were in our teens, it was all about being the best, going to the best school, having the highest SAT score. You know, if it was something about learning, it was not learning to be the, learn the best you can. It was, it was be better than the friend next to you. It was all like that. You know, your parents kind of like pushed that on you, right? It was like, why can't you be like your brother? You know, why aren't you like your sister? It was all like comparing. You know, very competitive culture, right? It was not that, it was not that healthy. But that was kind of the environment that was exposed for me. And if it was competitive during that time, my goodness, it's hyper-competitive now, isn't it? And some of you as parents are instilling that kind of uh, atmosphere perhaps to your children as well, you know? Not just to allow them to be a good best that they could be, but it has to be better than somebody else, right? Isn't that sort of the way that we, you know, bring this about. And it happens subtly. It happens all over. Competition kills the soul. Because the root of competition is pride. 
and the hunger to be better than somebody else, right? Remember that whole adage, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses is a, is a very subtle phrase of being competitive to anyone else, everyone else, to be better than somebody else, isn't it, right? That is exactly the opposite of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is not about position. It's about priority. Be the first to serve. Be the last to be served. That's the kingdom of God. Be the first person in seeking God. Be the last person in seeking the world. That's the kingdom of God. And another principle in the kingdom of God is, look, don't do what you do to please men or women. Don't let your motive of doing good or doing anything for the purpose of receiving credit or being recognized by people. The kingdom of God is we only need to please an audience of one. Amen? That is our only motive. It has to be our only motive. That's the kingdom of God that Jesus taught and died for. And so with that in mind, let's look at our text here today. Okay, verse 1, it begins by him in chapter 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples. Now it's interesting because up to this point, as we shared the last few weeks, Jesus was being contested all the time. Anything he said was being challenged by the Pharisees, the, the disciples of the Pharisees, the Herodians and so forth, Sadducees. They're all like trying to trap him at his words. And all throughout this, this tenure, Jesus re re rebutted back. You know? And if you look one verse before this, if you have your Bibles, you could turn there, but one verse before this is the last verse of chapter 22, verse 46. That chapter ends like this. No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So essentially, Jesus kind of like shut them off. All right, now, boom, quiet, no more. I don't need to be justifying what I'm saying. Okay, Pharisees, you want to stick around? Stay around, but keep quiet. That's basically what's happening. Now he's dedicating his attention to the disciples and to the people that really want to hear his word. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So he's shifting his teaching now to the disciples. But at the same time, he's telling the disciples in respect to the actions of these people, the Herodians, the Pharisees, and etc. Okay, so verse 2, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit at Moses' seat. Verse 3, so you must be careful to do everything that they tell you, but not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. All right, so if you were a Pharisee at this time, I, I think you would be like very embarrassed. Okay, you would be like, you know, grinding your teeth, okay? Essentially, Jesus is saying, look, these guys are appointed to you as teachers of the law, okay? They're seated in Moses' seat, a place of authority, a place of teaching position. Hear what they teach and just get the meat of that, but don't follow what they preach because they're not going to do what they teach. That's what Jesus is saying, okay? Do as I say, not as I do. It's the old adage, right? Don't follow what they do because what they do are going to be completely the opposite of what they teach. But do receive their teaching because the teaching is the Word of God. Teaching is the Torah, right? And so Jesus is accusing them indirectly of hypocrisy. Okay, you know what hypocrisy means, right? And we explained this before. It, is a, it comes from the Greek word of hippo, hypo, okay? And it comes from the image of, of a play, Greek play. In, in the ancient Greek plays, what happens is there were no female characters. It was all male actors. Well, there's a part for a female uh, character play. Men will put on a mask, a female, like a woman's mask, and play that part, okay? Hypo or hippo is this masking. Okay, pseudo, pretending to be something uh, that you're not. 
So it comes from that imagery of that word, hippo, hypocrite, hypocrisy. Doing something that they are not of. Okay? Don't do that is what Jesus is saying. Now, friends, how many of us are guilty of this warning that Jesus said? I think we could call out a lot of people, including ourselves, in hypocrisy, can't we? Right? And even as a, even as a pastor, you know, Sarah and I, you know, we, we, we try to be sensitive about this because now we have two grown adult boys, but, you know, when they're younger, you know, it was, it was very hard. It was very hard to practice at home what we preach at church. You know, there would be days where we preach about love, love everyone, love your neighbor, and then go home, we'll be like arguing with each other. You know, and the kids would be saying, that's hypocritical, you know, <laughs> right? Everywhere, every place. All right, how many parents are playing this hypocritical role at home? Right, we need to be very careful. Now, I'm kind of thankful for our church because not at this lot, the lot adjacent to us, you know, the APC lot, um, we, we have an opportunity each time that we come to church whether we actually live out what we believe. And what I mean by that is when you drive out of the parking lot, there's only one turn that you are legally allowed to make. It's the right turn, right? But I think myself included, many of us need to make a left turn to get to where we are, right? But how many have you, how many, okay, let's be honest. How many of you guys have made that left turn? Raise your hand. <laughs> only like half of us? But the other half are, you guys obey the law, but I don't think you're honest. Okay. I think we all are tempted to make that left turn. So when I first started at our church, you know, back in June, you know, being a new pastor, being a pastor, I, I, I wanted to observe that sign in, in you know, good faith. So I made right turn all the time. I didn't realize that we could make the U-turn here at CUC. I went all the way down to the next line and looked around. It took forever. So I got a little bit frustrated and go, well, why, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to get out of church here? You know? <laughs> but then later I realized, oh, okay, well, there's a loop here at CUC, so that kind of helps. But still, it's, it's kind of a pain, right, making that right chair. And so the temptation is always there. When there's no cars, when nobody's watching, the temptation becomes stronger, <laughs> right? And so first few months, you know, I was okay. And then one day, I was following this car out, and then the car in front of me, without any hesitation, made a bold <laughs> left turn. So, you know what? That kind of gave me confidence. <laughs> it gave me the assurance that says, I, I think this is okay. If he could do it, I could do it. And I'm not going to say who that person was. <laughs> it's some senior pastor, but anyway. <laughs> I won't say who that person was, okay? So that kind of gave me some confidence, like, hey, I could do this thing. If he could do it, I mean, I'm, I'm just an associate, I mean, right? Well, the temptation to be hypocritical always exists, okay? It's our job to resist that temptation. It's our job to not do what Jesus is pointing out, particularly in the next four verses between verse 4 through 7. So look at, let's, let's look at that, okay? Jesus accuses them of tying up heavy, cumbersome loads and putting them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger. All right, what these scribes and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees have done is they've taken 10 commandments that Moses, through God, Moses had, uh, through, through Moses, God has given, Ten Commandments, which was still hard enough, over time, by Jesus' time, it became 613 rules and regulations. That is a lot of rules to follow. 613, 365 prohibitions, 248 um, laws to do. Okay? Where did he get these numbers? 365 for one prohibition per day of the year. So 365, 
248 because there are 248 bones in the human body. That was the, that was the, the basis in which they came up with 613. Okay? Kind of like hocus pocus. But nonetheless, 10, 10 was even hard to memorize. You turn it into 613, who can follow all these rules? No one could, which is what Jesus is saying. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads. Right? They themselves cannot enter the kingdom of God, but they certainly don't want anybody else to enter either. So that was their motive. In Matthew chapter 11, the last three verses, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, for I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. Jesus undoes, undo? The burden. Undoes? Undid? Undoing? <laughs> Jesus, take away the burdens. While the Pharisees impose more and more, Jesus takes that away. That's the work of Christ. Aren't we glad we have our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Right? Verse 5, everything they do is done for people to see. Now listen carefully. I think we fall into this sin all the time. Everything they do is for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels in their garments long. I have a picture of here uh, to, to show you what, what a phylacteries is. This. Okay, so this is a, a thing that they wear on top of their forehead. It's a little cubicle box. Inside that box is a scroll. Of course, the scroll contains the Word of God. So a typical scroll will contain four, five, six commandments. And what they're doing is they're, they're wearing this in their forehead, walking around and saying, okay, I'm obeying these commandments today. It's a, it's a show of their obedience to God, a public display of their um, you know, supposed spirituality. But some make their phylacteries even wider as a display that their allegiance and their observance of the law is even better. Okay? And Jesus is pointing that out. All they're concerned about is how wide their phylactery is. This. It's not the width of the phylactery, it's the width of the person's character that counts. Amen? It's not the length of the tassel, but the depth of the person's servanthood and character that counts. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. Everything that these guys have done was for show, for people to see, to gain people's attention. But like I said, we need the attention of just one person. Our audience is not amongst one another, it's but an audience of one. Amen? Amen? Our Lord Jesus Christ. To make this illustration today, don't I look a little bit different today? I, I put on these new glasses. Don't I look better? No? Yeah, people have commented this looks pretty good, right? I, I do this for a show, a show and tell to tell you, okay? to make this illustration here as well. Now, I don't normally wear these glasses because it's heavier. It's thicker, it's heavier, and it really bothers my nose, but I put them on just for you today to make a point here, okay? <laughs> so that I could do this for people to see. In Mark 1, 6, the Bible says, John the Baptist wore clothing made of camel's hair, leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine a person wearing clothing made out of camel's hair with a simple belt, eating locusts and wild honey? Today we call them, sorry, homeless. Right? That, that's, that's the image of a homeless person, like a hobo. Right? But he was credited as a prophet of one of the greatest prophets that have ever lived. It's not the appearance that counts, it's the integrity of the heart. Right? That's Jesus' point. It's not how we look, it's not what we put on, it's not the kind of clothing, it's not the kind of flashiness and showing that counts, but it's the depth of our character, it's the deepness of our faith, it's the love of God in a genuine pursuit. Amen? That's what counts. That's what Christ is emphasizing. 
John says this, and uh, excuse me, yeah, John the Baptist says this in John 3.30, he must become greater, I must become less. Let me repeat that. The whole purpose of John the Baptist, his ministry was to elevate Christ while he vanishes. He must become greater while I must become less. Friends, I think we need to embrace that. How great the temptation for me to shine and hide Christ. How great is the temptation for me to stand out in front of others so that I could gain an attention, so that people could be all of my worth or caliber or whatnot. We all face that temptation, right? Remember I told you we lived in Korea for a few years? So when we were, Sarah and I were, would be walking around outside, particularly like in the Korean marketplace, you know, I would purposely speak English when I'm outside. <laughs> you know, I'll speak my English like very fluently, you know? <laughs> purposely, even though I speak Korean pretty good, so that people will marvel at my English. How great the temptation! I think we all do that to some extent, okay? I'm going to share one uh, embarrassing story regarding my parents, but God bless their heart. They're with the Lord. Uh, three years ago, they both passed. But years ago, back in 1958, 59, etc., uh, before my, my parents started dating, right? My mom, mom told, told us this story multiple times. My dad was pretty tall. He was like 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, by Korean standards, pretty tall. My, my mom being like 5'5", five, five, you know, 5'4", five, typical, right? She sees this tall, skinny man walking around, tucked underneath his armpit is Times Magazine, okay? <laughs> he has it like this and he's walking around. And my mom, being a teacher, you know, she just like fell in love with that, with that image, you know, because my dad, you know, tall, whether he was handsome or not, I don't know, but, you know, he had this Time magazine, of all the magazine, it wasn't like a Korean comic book or a newspaper. It was an American genuine magazine. And he had it in his armpit walking around like as if like he's going to read it and stuff like that. <laughs> and so my mom just like, she, she, she was just head over heels with that and fell in love. And later on she said, oh, I was duped. <laughs> Turns out that my dad doesn't speak a word of English. <laughs> And she was right. In fact, for 45 years they lived in America. My, the, the language, the word that my dad uh, knew the best was hello. <laughs> okay? And that was his, that was his thing. When, when we, uh, back in those days before the, the cell phone, right? When the phone rings in the house, he, even though he may not be the closest one, he would go and grab the phone. I'm like, why? So he, he would pick up the phone, hello? Right? That's, that's the way he kind of answers the phone. Hello? And he doesn't understand, he goes, I don't understand what they're saying. And he gives the phone to us, right? <laughs> all for a show, all for an image, all to get some recognition, to be visible, to be recognized. And that's the accusation that Jesus is saying. All right, let's go to verse 6. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. Again, right, the politicians, forgive me, politicians, right, when there is an open event, with cameras and, and, and film and you know, mic, et cetera. They love to be in the front row seats. However, when they come to church, they want to be at the very end, all right? And so it's that kind of a propensity, right? Publicized meetings, they want to be recognized. But before God, they want to hide. Verse seven, they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and be called rabbi by others. Love it when others Pay attention to them. They only act important when seen. Love it more when their titles, their status are recognized, but not their character. Notice it's interesting that Jesus mentions this in respect to the marketplace. A rabbi should be recognized as a rabbi in the temple or in the synagogue. Right? That's where they belong. But apparently, they are not in the house of God. They're roaming around in the marketplace wanting people to re recognize them as, as somebody important, spiritual. You see the hypocrisy in that, right? 
Verse 8, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you're all brothers. And I'm going to um, combine verse 8, 9, and 10 together, so let me read that to you. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. So here what Jesus is saying is, keep things in perspective. Okay? Some of us may have better education than others. Some of us has, excuse me, some of us may be more successful than others. But don't be comparing your position, your status in relation to somebody else only because they're weaker or, or, or less fortunate or less learned. Because in respect to God's position, no matter how important we may be, no matter how educated we may be, in respect to God, who is lifted up in high places, we are nothing. Does that make sense? Keep it in perspective. And, but you know, that's what we do. Oh, what school did you come from? Where did you go for your undergrad? Or, oh, you don't have a master's? Oh, I'm sorry. You know? Right? <laughs> oh, that seminary? Are you, are you serious? Right? You know? Fuller Theological Seminary is where I'm from. Anything less than that, <laughs> right? <laughs> we all have that chip on our shoulder, okay? If we're more success successful than somebody else, okay? I think there is this tendency to look down on others. What Jesus is saying is, look, don't worry about whether you're called a rabbi or an instructor, okay? In respect to God, there's only one rabbi, there's only one instructor, there's only one father, right? Among us, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Among ourselves, we're all equal level, right? So don't worry about measuring yourself up sizing somebody else because in God's perspective we're on even equal equal ground right it's like you know I don't know if this illustration is helpful for you but like like a uh, in Manhattan you know I have all these high-rises right maybe like a, a three-story newly renovated condominium looking down on a two-story rundown apartment and saying, oh, you, you're so small, you're so smelly, you're so short. Not realizing that behind it is the Freedom Tower. You know how ridiculous that sounds, right? For a three-story building to criticize a two-story building in respect to a 110-story building. And it's kind of like that. Right? In God's eyes, we're all sinners. In God's perspective, we are all falling short of the glory of God. And so don't be so critical. Don't be so judgmental. Don't think that your status and your wealth or your growth or whatever it may be is any better than somebody else. Treat each other with dignity, with respect, and with love is what he's saying. And in fact, verse 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. That's the charge. If you think you're great, if you think you have a PhD, great, sir. If you think you are a pastor and you're spiritual, great, good for you, serve more. The measure of your greatness is determined by the level of your servanthood. That's what Jesus is saying. The greater you are, the more you have to serve others. That's the kingdom principle. There's a song years ago. I'm going to sing this for you, so bear with me. The line goes very simple. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. That's the whole lyric. It's like five minutes long, but that's the whole lyric. Okay? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, 
Learn to be the servant of all. Learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Isn't that a beautiful song? All right? That's it. It's the easiest song ever. But so hard to do. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, it's not, greatness is not measured on your spirituality. Greatness is not measured on how much Bible you know, on how much spiritual gifting you have. Greatness is measured by the depth of your servanthood. Serving other, because that's what Jesus was all about. Right? He whom is equal to God, did not consider equality with God, but humbled himself to the point of death, death on the cross. Right? He whom is God, Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus' MO, and that's what, he's, that's what he's telling us. And lastly, for those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Like I said, kingdom of God is not about position, but priority. Prioritizing servanthood. Prioritizing the heart of God. Friends, I want to leave you with this summary points, and then I'll invite the praise team to come up. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the first person to serve and be the last person to be served. Amen? If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the first person to seek God all the time. Be the last person to seek the world every time. Okay? Pride kills, humility saves. We must fight against this temptation of called pride and self-recognition. We need to fight for humility. That's the call for us here at the church today. Competition kills the body of Christ. Servanthood saves the body. So let us become servants of all. Amen? Let us embrace that servant attitude. I've been stressing this point all through my tenure here. Okay? We need to get out of this entitlement mode. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you need to get out of this entitlement mode by coming to service and saying, what's in it for me? What does this church, what can this church offer me? We need to move away from that mode. We need to be asking, how can I contribute to this body? What can I do for the kingdom of God? That's the correct worshiper's attitude. And that's what Jesus is teaching. So let's have a transformed mind, a transformed heart. Let's have a kingdom, healthy kingdom mindset, which is person of service, person of serving, okay? And that whatever we do, we do it for the audience of one, not for one another, not for recognition, not for some kind of a attaboy, but just praise from the Most High God and Him only. And the words of John the Baptist, John 3.30, I must decrease so that he must increase. Let us embrace that into our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that speak truth to us today. The temptation to be, want to be great and to be recognized as great is so strong. Each day we need to master this. So help us, Lord. Help us to first die to ourselves, for without it, we're not going to be alive in Christ. Help us, Lord, to get a right perspective on how we may become true 
worshipers and true Christians, Lord. For it is not about me, it is not about self-preservation, self-elevation, but it is about elevating you. In the name of Jesus, that is above every other name. Let our lives reflect that. Jesus Messiah, Jesus Messiah, the name of all names, Lord, is what we want to praise and what we want to embrace each time, Lord. So may that be our testimony, may that be our motive, may that become our being in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you rise, let's sing Jesus Messiah and close out today's worship.
after the benediction, uh, if you could, if you're not pressed for uh, time, if you could just remain in your seat for just a couple of minutes, Patrick will come up and give us an update on our building situation. He received the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit keep our eyes focused on Christ, for it is He who must become greater and I must become less. May we embrace this truth as our mission in life. May you go with this in love and in joy and enjoy. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Please be seated.